G'day expats and welcome to another episode of Expat Chat. Uh, today we're talking about how do interest rates affect Australian expats. Uh, obviously there's a lot of topic about this right now, episode 40. Today I'm joined by my mate and colleague James Ridley who's the Managing Director of the APAC region. G'day James. G'day Brett and for anyone that's listening and hasn't been listening before, obviously joined today co-host Brett Evans, Managing and Founding Director Alice over yep. in the EMEA region. So how are you going, Brett? How's the sand pit? Mate, uh, we had a bit of a scare last week. It's starting to get a bit hot. So we're worried about summer was early, but it's cooled down this week, which is good. So um, it's sort of like watching a balloon. It's about to burst. You know, it's coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just don't know when. So, uh, but oh. mate, it's, uh, it's interesting times, man, from a geopolitical point of view. There's a lot of discussions in this region particularly around oil prices and increasing production by OPEC and, and do they do, do they don't, you know, obviously interest rates, uh, you know, is a big one topic right now that everyone's trying to manage, uh, yep. which dovetails into the oil price, rising oil price inflation. So uh, yep. today we thought we'd uh, run through a, a quick call to discuss how interest rate changes do affect expats. And uh, mate, before we jump in, let's get the jingle out of the way. So all the information that uh, you are imbibing and uh, absorbing uh, as part of this conversation or video, it should be treated uh, as educational and informational purposes only. Please do not construe this as personal financial advice. Speak to your professional like James and myself. One day, mate, we'll get that down pat, won't we? Uh, you'd think by now we'd, we'd have it down pat or some sort of jingle or recording. <laughs> mate, it's, it's, it's the old uh, five Ps and, and uh, yeah, prior preparation prevents something performance. Um, I think of it as I'm talking, so I should uh, take the extra five minutes beforehand to do something witty. But anyway, it's better than the usual, you know, 15 line compliance um, uh, disclaimer that uh, unfortunately most uh, clients have to, you know, cope with uh, because of the right. legislative you know, framework we live in today. That's right, man. Now, listen, interest rates, really good to topic, really important topic. And I guess, you know, probably the biggest move that we saw last week, only last week, um, or maybe last week or the week before was on the 14th and 15th of March, the US Fed, you know, finally sort of making a move on interest rates and putting out 0.25. Most markets actually they did appreciate it and you saw share markets sort of eat it up a bit and consume it and sort of lift a little bit. But right now, central banks, they've got a very hard task uh, when it comes to how aggressive to go on interest rates. I mean, obviously they're dealing right now with already high inflation, but then you've got this geo, I suppose, political crisis, Ukraine, Russia is kicking off, which is causing even more of an impact on inflation, heightened inflation. Um, so, you know, what do central banks do? Do they go big? Do they go quick? Or do they, you know, just be patient? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? And, you know, what are your thoughts on how this is impacting uh, expats right now? Well, really, it's really going to depend on the jurisdiction they're in. You know, you've got yep. two different rule books being played out by the UK versus uh, the US. US is going hard and fast early. So obviously we saw the rate rise early this month. They're talking yep. about two more rate rises in May and June you know, mm -hmm. and then see how it settles down. In the UK, they're taking a wait and see approach. So right mm -hmm. now the UK inflation numbers are running about 6%, but when they factor in increasing energy costs, it may be as high as 8%. So mm -hmm. the talk is that, you know, the uh, Bank of England may not raise their rates for um, a number of months. And, yep. uh, you know, it's, it's going to create a bit of a distortion in especially currency markets. And the reason yes. being is obviously... Yeah, you know, the overarching strategy of investors throughout the world is yield. And mm -hmm. when a government or a central bank raises their official cash rate, that in turn affects their their treasury notes, their bonds, and those sort of things. So people rush to those currencies that give them that yield. At the moment, mm -hmm. um, you know, the US has been running very low interest rates. And mm -hmm. so that's why I've seen a bit of apathy towards, you know, the US dollar. Also, two commodity prices have been holding the Australian dollar up. So it's sort of yeah. that distortion effect. But if we see, you know, the US Fed and Jerome Powell and his buddies um, start to raise rates, then what we're going to start to see is more appreciation in the US dollar because investors will be chasing that yield, chasing that That's return. Right. So potentially, you know, we always talk about there's a number of risks when managing your finances as an expat. There's uh, geopolitical risk, sovereignty risk, and currency risk. And yes. currency risk is a big one. And it's one yep. of the reasons we always talk about having a diversified uh, wealth strategy you know, for that reason, because you don't want to be holding all your eggs in one currency. At the end of the day, 
you know, no one, and I mean, no one can predict what currency market's going to do. On the last episode, you talked very, you know, correctly about Brexit and how that affected the US pound. On the other mm. way, we saw what happened to Swiss franc when they depegged from the euro. You know, these mm. things happen. And uh, I think we're going to see more of a distortion in, in currency markets coming over the next, you know, three to six months. So mm. now more than ever, it's important that, you know, expats really look at where they're holding their wealth and making sure that they're suited to diversify because we are going to see weakness in the pound. We're going to see strength in the US dollar. You know, the RBA keeps talking about transitory inflation in Australia, which I think is a lot yeah. of BS. Um, you know, ask anyone who's doing their shopping or buying petrol. There's nothing transitory about it. It's it's a daily thing. And, uh, you know, the only thing that's not rising in Australia is, is wage inflation. Uh, everything else is going up at a rate of knots. We're now seeing developers going bust. You know, there's one the other day, Condev, um, that went bust. They were talking about inflation of 1.5% in their costs every month for the last yeah. 18 months. So that is going to trickle down to the consumer. What does it mean for the expat sitting on, you know, on the bench, you know, trying to work out whether it is zig or zag? Diversification. Manage your risk. Make sure, you know, if you are holding all your wealth in sterling, you know, spread it to US dollars, spread it to Australian dollars. You know, if you have a portfolio, make sure you diversify across markets and currencies. You know, we're going to see probably the, the, the main pain points is going to be with respect to property. Um, mm-hmm. There was an interesting article that came out yesterday out of Oz talking about the number of suburbs in both Brisbane, Melbourne and Sydney that are going through mortgage stress already. Yeah. This is before know, rate rises even kick off. I know. And, and we always sort of, whenever we do those sort of quarterly market reviews, when we look at the, the data packs that come out from APRA and ABS, and there's always that sort of concern that, okay, well, you know, banks non-performing assets they're actually at a quite high levels you know comparable to i suppose 2008 you know when we had the gfc but still high know, even now see, it's it's still yeah, high in 2008 i guess that's a concern especially when you've also got a, a scenario that's playing out where money and debt has never been cheaper um so yeah. it does it, it's a, a really good reflection that a lot of people have they've sort of leveraged themselves through the teeth and, and too yeah. much and uh, because wage growth isn't there, and now we're going to go through that process where interest rates are going to go up. And, you know, naturally your monthly repayments will go up. If you're not a, uh, a household which you know has good cash, or has good income, has a bit of an emergency on, then you'll start to feel it. You know, on those mortgage repayments when they start to go up. I think when you look at mortgage rates and interest rates in Australia, I know that last month Jerome Powell, uh, not Jerome Powell, sorry, um, Governor Lowe at the National Press Conference, so early in the, this month, I should say, second or third of March, is talking about the, the sort of key data points that they're looking at, which is the, the fact that, yes, wage growth, that's one of them. We've had really poor wage growth in Australia for probably about 10 years, to be honest, compared to the yeah. US and a few years. Uh, rubbish. Um, and, I mean, you can put that back on the government and, and a lot of the policies that they've had come out in the last 10 years. But then the other one was unemployment rate. You know, right now, funny enough, we've actually got a record low unemployment rate in Australia in the last 13 years. And that's been a really strange theme, which has actually kicked off off the back of the pandemic. A lot of Western developed economies have actually got record low unemployment rate, but a lot have also got poor wage growth. And that doesn't really help when you've got high inflation. So... Yeah. It, it does cause that, a bit of a gap there. And that's, I guess, why I think central banks have got such a hard task. They need to work out how to drive down inflation, which normally means they turn on the interest rate cap, but they've also got to do it in a way where they're not sort of causing, I guess, I guess you know, cor- massive corrections on the property market or something like that, or which I don't think we'll see, but I think it's very normal that we'll see some areas pull back. I mean, we're already seeing it now where daily... Days in which um, properties are on, you know, on the market, that's already starting to increase a couple of weeks. So, um, but I think all in all, you know, things will keep going. But I guess when you look at interest rates, taking a diversified approach, one thing I was talking about before was uh, how over in the Middle East, there's a lot of currencies which are, I guess, considered quite exotic, um, would you say, for the platforms. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, but I mean, one thing that we know is a lot of the currencies, they're pegged to the US dollar. Yep. And also and then, the, the local central banks in those countries will follow suit with US Fed. So when US Fed increase interest rates, the central bank of UAE increase interest rates as well. And that's yep. the way they keep that parity between the two and, and keep that pegging. Yep. I mean, one thing which I thought, I honestly thought with the Australian dollar compared to the US dollar, 
I, I would have thought we actually would have seen the AUD down a little bit, sort of down towards 72, 73 cents then, but I think we hit 75 cents overnight. It's dropped a little bit now, but I wonder what's causing that to, you know, to lift against the US dollar. Commodity prices. Was, yeah, commodity prices are holding quite strong for us, but our exports, our net exports, they're not huge at the moment. No. You know, so we've got everything going on with China. China's gone into that partial lockdown. So I'm quite surprised by the AUD being as strong as it is right now because it, it just, um, yeah, it's a hard one to predict. When you look at, uh, say, an LNG carrier, you know, it's it's one of those uh, uh, ships that have the, uh, like the balloons on the deck, you know, they're carrying liquefied natural gas. And when they carry those things, you know, through the middle of the pandemic, that ship was worth $10 million. Now mm-hmm. that ship is worth $200 million, the same mm-hmm. ship. So yeah. even if even if the actual physicality of what they're moving, the number of ship movements is down, just by virtue of the spike in prices, um, the dollars are up. Now, yep. the big question is going to be is obviously when you look at the commodity prices and what's going on, there's a number of governors that dictate those commodity prices. China's one mm-hmm. of them. You know, China's not exactly shooting the lights out right now. You've got talk in Shanghai and other regions of going into lockdowns. Um, so that will help hurt you know, GDP, that will hurt uh, economic growth. But then also, too, you've got what's going on in the Ukraine right now. And it's interesting because, believe it or not, and, and clients find this sort of bemusing, is the, the equity markets right now are higher than the 23rd of February, the day before Russia invaded Ukraine. And the yeah. reason being is it's all about um, the markets are very efficient in pricing and risk and pricing in what the contagion effect and fallout is going to be from a from an event, and they've worked out, you know, what this is not the end of the world. Um, mm. Something as a bit of a something for the I call it the shit file, you know, just just um, <laughs> random stuff. As you know, believe it or not, Ukraine manufactures most of the wiring looms for European car manufacturers. So I didn't know that. Kind of had to catch up with a client the other day. Who works in the automotive business, and he said, you know, that's going to hurt the automotive game. So, yeah. you know, not only are they short on semiconductors for the computers, but they're going to be short on wiring looms for, uh, for the cars as well too. So these are little things that are just all bubbling out in its isolation is not the end of the world. But this combined with this combined with this is causing this inflationary effect. That's you know, right. will, will, will the, um, you know, the Ukraine conflict affect energy prices? You know, right now there is talk about, you know, Europe sourcing other other um, other options with respect to um, to energy and gas. Um, yep. Then you've got you know issues like right now in Kazakhstan there's a problem with the pipeline, so that creates a sure. bottleneck. Um, so that will mean you know energy prices will go up. Then you've got Russia trying to do the the the, uh, the, the, the you know the Moscow two step. You know now they're asking for people to buy Russian oil using rubles, which to me is it's a bit silly because they've got all these foreign reserves. Mm. Um, you know, sitting that they can't touch. They're actually better off accepting euros and those sort of things. And the biggest thing is certainly a lot of the European countries would be breaching sanctions if they accepted and paid uh, in rubles rather than yeah. in, um, in um, euros or US dollars. So mm. there's all this consternation going on in the background, but it is creating this lifting the cost of living. You know, just go to the petrol bowser. You know, just go and, and get your energy bill. It's going to start to feed her in. So to me, you know, the RBA has been sort of sitting there with a the la-la-la. We're not going to raise interest rates till 2024. Now we've seen that conversation start to unwind. Oh, and yeah, yeah, pretty much everyone's, everyone's looking at the first kickoff in, in August this year of interest rates. And, you know, I've seen yeah. as early as June. Um, do you reckon, rate prices. Well, I mean, yeah, we, with the rate rises, because the cash rate's obviously quite low, do you think the first one will be a, a mild one just to take us up to 0.25, the cash rate? Depends if they take the US approach or the UK approach. Do they go in hard yep. and fast, get it out of the way and let yep. things settle? Or yep. do they take the UK approach or softly, softly, and, and we yep. don't know yet. That's the thing. I think the biggest thing with, uh, with the RBA right now is they've got, you know, or the elephant in the room is property. You know, if they really tap the brakes and those numbers I was talking about with, with defaults, we're not talking yeah. about just Western Sydney and, and, and Northern Melbourne. We're talking yeah. about some of, some of the blue chip suburbs as well. But it's yeah. not just homeowners. It's also renters as well. Yeah. So well, There was a good article that was published in the AFR, the Financial Review, and they're saying that it's taking people an additional three years now post-pandemic to save for a house deposit 
compared to pre-pandemic levels. And that's just because of, you know, the house prices being on the run that they've been on. So interest rates do need to slow that down. And as I said, that's why things are slowing down. But I mean, I want to pick your brain, Brett, about um, talking about energy prices, oil prices, and, you know, we're obviously over $100 per barrel at the moment, US. Do you think off the back of that, it's too early to make this kind of call just yet, but do you think governments, if the geopolitical risk continued with Russia and Ukraine, do you think governments would try and pivot and focus on more funding into renewable energy? Do you think that could be a key that might develop next year or the year after if that was where things were heading? We always see when there's a spike in energy prices, we look yep. for alternatives. Um, yep. And it's always the case. I remember a number of years ago when the oil was getting you know, up to 150, 160 a barrel and they said, right, yeah, we need to push into renewables. So to me, the answer is yes and no. And the reason it's a yes is because it will force people that direction. But no, because I don't think the situation in Ukraine will be a long-term thing that's going to keep energy prices up. You know, I agree. If, if, if you look at you know the playbook that Putin's working on, he's sending in his D-team, his conscripts who've been virtually taken from the, the arms of their mothers, um, right. and they're running out of petrol, they haven't got GPSs, they've got no maps. It really seems to be like a, a Clayton's wall, um, which to me, I think Putin's doing on purpose to try and get uh, the West to the table to negotiate. You know, he's, yeah. he's in there just creating issues and on the on the human front, it's devastating. But, you know, with a country the size and the might of the size of the, you know, the Russian uh, military forces, they should have had Ukraine in a week. And I've, yeah, you know, both of us have got clients who are ex-military and I've, I've picked their brains ad nauseum and to the guys and girls out there, thank you very much for my stupid questions. But mm. they all agree that um, there's no reason why they couldn't have done this, but it might be Russia posturing to show the show the West that, look, we're not interested in starting World War Three. We're going to send in our D team, not the A team. You know, if we send in the A team, it might be a prelude to Poland or Romania or what that looks like. Whereas um, by sending in the conscripts who, you know, don't know the, the right end of a gun, um, it's not a threatening position. If that makes sense. Mm. You know, it's sort of yeah. we're invading, but we're not. And yeah. um, I think that's the the feedback that I've got from from our clients anyway who, who work in the military um, because, yeah, it's really, it, it's, a, it's a strange one, you know, with, with everything at his disposal, he's, he's not followed his rule book. No, but, I mean, the sanctions that have been placed on him, especially with, uh, I suppose, excluding Russia from the SWIFT system, I mean, that's huge. Um, I would have thought that they're just, they're, they're running out of time, they're running out of capital, and you would think over the next, one or two months, Putin would be looking for an off ramp ASAP. He'd be going, yep. okay, I'm just, you know, the company, I'm putting my country, Russia, into pretty much probably a recession and a bit of a depression probably for the next five to 10 years with these sanctions. And a lot of these sanctions will stay, to be honest, as well. Yep. And then it's not a case where at the end of the year, okay, yep, war is done. Okay, we'll lift all those sanctions. Uh-uh, they're going to stay for years and years. So uh, he's really got to find an off ramp, I think, very soon. And I mean, you know, one to three months to come to, you know, a bit of a, a, an easy closure and come to obviously some sort of negotiation with Ukraine. And I guess the hardest thing is trying to work out whether he's trying to build that sort of buffer zone um, yep. because you look at how Russia's been invaded over the last couple of hundred years, um, that's through that great European plane, or whether he's obviously trying to get Ukraine to not sign up to NATO. But I thought Ukraine's already come out, so they're not signing up for NATO. So, yeah. yeah, you really need to get Zelensky and Putin to the same table in person to talk. Don't know when that's going to happen too soon, though. The question is, what what sort of person are we dealing with with Putin? Are we dealing with a military genius who's just trying to drag the West to the table to get what he wants? Yeah. Are we dealing with a guy who's lost his marbles and, you know, and there's talk yeah. about Parkinson's <laughs> and all sorts of stuff going on that, you know, well, uh, I, their I, clients I are swear, discussing? I swear the Russians elite were looking at take, removing him from office and having someone yeah. else put in. And, and pretty much trying to end the war ASAP. But I also think a lot of people in Russia, and including the elites, they're all quite scared of him as well. So. well I mean, what point with the oligarchs, you know, with sanctions yeah. on them, that is there to put pressure on internally um, onto Russia and uh, and Putin in particular, to, you know, so yeah. he gets his crew, in inverted commas, to really put pressure on him to wind it back because they're losing everything. At the moment, it's got to be working. Surely that's got to be working. You look at some of 
some of the things that have been seized by European governments and yeah. some of the uh, the assets. I think what I think the most popular one that's sort of been in the papers was that that seven hundred million dollar yacht or something. Dilba. Um, yeah. 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 We're, we're very very famous. Um, so surely you know it's only a matter of time. Uh, I guess we're all sort of it's in, the way I see it now as well with share markets. They've sort of digested everything that's going on with this yeah, geopolitical. Pro- it's all yeah. priced in. It, yeah, it, that's right. So anything that's sort of coming out now, it's nothing new. Yeah. So the market goes, okay, it's going on. There's some terrible things happening, you know, where they're bombing churches or schools and those sort of things. But the market's not really reacting to that. They're just yep. it's it's already priced in it. And you see most markets, especially off the back of the 14th, have lifted quite aggressively. I mean, the Nasdaq from the 14th of March when we received that interest rate. Uh, increase in the US. The Nasdaq's done twelve percent since that day. How's that? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, anyway, well, the market's virtually telling us that um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who live in Idaho, aren't going to change their spending and aren't going to change their their lifestyle because of what's going on in the Ukraine. That's what it boils down mm-hmm. to. It's pure dollars. Right. And yeah. you know, whether you know, people have been saying, well, the inflation's just a short term thing because of of the energy prices, but I, you know. Mm-hmm the way they work out and calculate inflation. It's on a basket of goods. It's not just all that, you know, uh, you know, energy prices. So to me, the inflation issue is an issue. Mm. You correctly pointed out the market has priced that in. The market mm. is comfortable. And a client said to me yesterday, said, well, with interest rates rising, surely this is bad for all assets. And I said, no. And I said, the rule book for most reserve bank governors is official mm. cash rates of on or around 3%. And the economy in, in Australia and the rest of the world have been very successful and profitable when cash mm. rates are normal. We're just yeah. not, not used to rising, you know, when, uh, you know, coming off a very, very low base. And essentially, interest rates haven't been so low since Captain Cook rocked up to Botany Bay. And to, to me, the, my, you know, we had this discussion with this client yesterday and they said, right, you looking, putting your crystal ball out and looking ahead for the next you know, year or two where's the risks, where's the opportunities and those sort of things. And I said, well, you know, with companies, um, it's quite easy. You know, look at companies that aren't interest rate sensitive. Look at companies that don't have high gearing. Companies are no, no different to consumers. You know, if yep. a consumer is highly leveraged and is living paycheck to paycheck, interest rate rises will certainly affect them. Companies are exactly the same. And it's very simple to look at and see what a company's gearing ratio is. Um, hmm. companies that rely on gearing, they'll certainly be affected. So you're looking at your infrastructure stocks and those sort of things, they'll they'll take a bit of a hit. Um, yeah. But on the upside, they may have more uh, throughput or patronage or whatever the, the, that service is. On the property side, that's the one I see with the most risk because there's a whole generation out there who hasn't had a mortgage rate greater than 4%. Yes. You know, they're bitching and moaning now with you know uh, cash rates starting to move or talk about moving. Um, we haven't got there yet. And if you look at the average mortgage of, I think it was a $700,000 property and yep. uh, $700,000 loan, sorry, on a property, you know, 20% LV um, deposit down, 80% gearing, uh, a 25 basis point rise is going to be in the order of $500 to $700 a month mm-hmm. in extra payments. Can they afford that? That's right. Well, that's that's the concern, isn't it? People have gone out, they've over-leveraged themselves. And I guess we had APRA swoopy, I think it was October last year, and with that ceiling or not. Yeah, assessment rate. Right. Yeah. That's right. Room serviceability rate, regardless of your mortgage rate being 2 2.5%, or whatever it might be, it's like, well, we don't care. We're going to assess you at 5% so you can make it work. Um, so, I mean, two things. Yep, interest rates, we'll start to see it go up. I also think that APRA might not wait for RBA and go, okay, we're going to lift that floor again. Go, we're going to do it at 6% because we know interest rates are coming. We know people are going to get pinched uh, and therefore it's time to just do what we can to try and sort of, I suppose, simmer the property market down a little bit and just prepare people accordingly. But, I mean, going back to sort of the topic we are talking about earlier, currency risk, I mean, at the moment, a lot of questions that I commonly get about currency is, you know, should I be transferring money back home now, James, or should I be waiting? It's just like, well, I guess we wish we had that crystal ball, don't we? And um, I guess... We'd be sitting on a yacht right now, wouldn't we? <laughs> that, that's right. But I guess taking a bit more of a, um, a logical approach, using dollar cost averaging, you know, split it up over obviously each month or each quarter, depending on what your, your cash flow is like. And that just helps, you know, spread out your average sort of cost of that currency exchange yep. rather than trying to hold it all 
in, I suppose, US dollars or pounds and then sending it all back within six months of your returning. That's when people get caught out. Um, and then essentially, you know, they've lost a significant amount of value on their assets as well. It can go both ways, but again, no one's got that crystal ball. So you should be taking more of a methodical approach, just spreading it out and dollar cost averaging, putting in other assets when uh, it's sent back to Australia. I think, you know, to me, we can take what the, the precursors are to a strong or weak currency, you know, commodity prices, interest rates, economic prosperity in general. And, you know, you'd have to say that commodity prices I can't see being sustained in the long term short term mm-hmm. yes medium term question mark depending on how crazy the guy in Moscow gets um, yeah. but generally speaking if the central bank oh, sorry the um, US Fed is raising interest rates out of step of this of the RBA that is suddenly going to cause a flip and instead of yep. saying 75 cents the US dollar it could be 72 71 you know, depending on how long the RBA hold off on raising rates, the longer that goes, the more weakness you get to get in the Australian dollar uh, because it's just an arbitrage opportunity. You know, they've got to go bounce back and forth between currencies, getting the best yield where they can. And, uh, you know, by middle of this year, 30th of June, if the US Fed's got two rate rises or three, including this month's one, in the bag and the RBA's yeah. done nothing uh, and, you know, the things settle down in, in uh, the Ukraine, Commodity prices yep. come back. Um, you are going to see the Australian dollar, you know, undergo a bit of weakness. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. It's just, you know, naturally when there's a widening gap in interest rates between two key countries, there we're going to see one of them weaken significantly. And I think you're right. I think Australia will be a, on the the poor side of that, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I, I always have thought that the the comfortable level for the AUD is usually around 75, 76 cents. To be honest, I feel like that's always been a historical average when markets are normal uh, and efficient um, and, and right now we're sort of already there or, you know we're winding up towards it but you've got high inflation you've got record low interest rates commodity prices also at high so it kind of needs to come back down and stabilize but we need to wait until probably Russia and uh, the geopolitical position happening over there also settles down and uh, there's just a, a lot that the market is consuming yeah no, there is and um, you know I guess that's why we like our job every day is different it's always evolving it's a narrative piece, you know, in terms of the dovish or hawkish and, and everyone sort of reads the tea leaves of central bank governors and really tries to understand what's going through their heads. To be honest with you, I think they're changing their minds every five minutes because they're really yeah. they're silvering through a lot of data and a lot of information. And, and we're not just dealing with a pandemic, you know, we're pe- dealing with a pandemic and a conflict and we're dealing with a pandemic, a conflict and rising inflation. And uh, any one of those things, three things, you know, in, in isolation is a big deal. The fact that we've got yeah. all three going on right now um, means they've got their hands full. That's right. I mean, I mean, if we sort of pivot a little bit for a second, we look at what Australia's been through in the last couple of years. It's it's been amazing. When you look at 2019, we had those terrible bushfires. Yep. At the end of the year, 2020, we roll out a pandemic, and then 2021, um, I'm sure there was something in there which I just can't think of. Oh, well, uh, lockdowns had- and and sort of okay. embracing COVID. I think, yeah, lockdowns and probably a second wave, to be honest. And Don't then, forget, 1st November, borders opening. That was a big thing for expats. Yep, that's right. And then 2022, we've had the floods again. Uh, so, and then 2022, we've had Russia, Ukraine. We've had first interest rate rises. So there's just been a lot that's been going on, you know, in the last three years. Uh, we don't usually see kind of huge events in three years. It's usually sort of big events every sort of five to seven, to be honest. So, yes, the market's been consuming a lot lately. Yeah, we've got a lot of compression and a lot of, um, you know, uh, bunching in just a lot of big events that, uh, you know, certainly you could you could view COVID as a black swan event. You could certainly view, I don't know whether you classify Ukraine as a black swan event because that's been going on since 2014 in the background. It hasn't yeah. really stopped. Okay. Um, but, you know, one thing we always had to clients and, and these sort of experiences are a great lesson for those who are especially new to investing. Um, one thing I can guarantee, we can't guarantee returns, but I can guarantee volatility. Uh, there'll always be something else in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in three years' time. And that's why oh, yeah. it's always important to have that balanced uh, approach to, to managing your wealth. You know, at the end of the day, regardless of what's going on in the world, every day passes and you need to focus on making sure that you're optimizing and, and making the most of that. And, you know, the biggest thing out of what we're seeing with COVID, with um, uh, the Ukraine conflict, 
there's winners and losers. You know, it's not mm. just everyone's a loser or everyone's a winner. Um, so set and forget, that's not a strategy. You know, uh, set and forget you would have held Qantas from, you know, the 1st of March 2020 to now. Um, that has exactly been a very good performer. Uh, whereas yeah. at the moment, Woodside, Santos, BHP are all killing it um, on the commodity front. So, you know, making sure diversification is is important part of your portfolio, making sure both jurisdictionally and, um, uh, you know, sector-wise, you've, you've got a good spread because yeah. it's not the end of the world. Uh, when we go through these scenarios, they've been going on since the markets first invented, you know, hundreds of years ago, and they'll continue to go on. Uh, but, yeah. you know, the important thing is to just keep your focus. Don't let emotion get the better part of you. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, certainly just keep looking after yourself and the rest will take care of itself. That's right. Yeah. I mean, when we look at sort of panic selling, the concept of panic selling, which um, it's uh, when people make those decisions, obviously they're, they're relying too much on their emotions, obviously, and they're not taking a step back taking that 30,000 foot view at their overall strategy, which in hindsight, oh, hang on, I'm not meant to be touching these funds or not to be meant to be drawing an account-based pension for a few years, those sort of things. So panic selling is not really going to provide any, you know, benefit. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, yeah, I mean, it's always a, a tough conversation to be having, but I guess when you look at the way markets have tracked, um, you know, it seems like a little theme that might be developing, especially recently, is markets are starting to lift a little bit. They're priced in, obviously, the risk, which is good. Interest rates will be on the rise, but I still think, my opinion is that we're still going to finish, actually, in the black by the end of the year. I still think most okay. share market might do 5 to 7% this year, even though we've started pretty awfully. But, you know, we're starting things to lift and improve. So I think we're just going to be patient. And that's that's investing, you know, on a long enough is- time it is, you know, last year was a great year from a calendar year performance-wise. This year, not yeah. so much. It's just going to be this um, uh, balancing act between the two and averaging out, you know, as long as we're still hitting our averages over a long term, that's all you should yeah. be worried about. So, but, uh, Matt, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Um, just yeah. once more housekeeping, guys and girls, we've got our budget yeah. webinars and seminars coming up. Um, yeah. I'll include those details in the show notes below. Um, to me, this is going to be a, a crack of a budget. A, because we're still talking about tax residency rules, but B, we've got both parties that are going to be opening the wallet and oh. really trying to uh, carry some favour. So, uh, <laughs> you know, one thing we do with both the seminars and the, and the webinars we're very proud about, it is live. It's not a pre-recorded yeah. session that, you know, we just hit play and sit back and with our feet on the table and eat a banana. Um, there is a Q&A session at the end that you are able to, you know, partake and that is sometimes as important as the session itself because uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, our job in our roles is to educate expats. And yeah. uh, if we can do that by clarifying a couple of uh, misconceived ideas or mistruths, then you know, we've done our job. That's exactly right. I think for a lot of expats, they do get uh, such valuable information, especially out of us, just from that Q&A section. They realise that expats all around the world have very similar issues and similar mm-hmm. problems. Um, so it, it's probably reassuring that they're not the only ones thinking that. And then, you know, it's just as simple as us addressing it on that kind of webinar as well. Exactly. So we look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week is the first one, Dubai on the 31st. Then we've got Abu Dhabi on the 5th. And then we've got the webinars on the 6th and 7th. So there is not a time zone uh, that we haven't covered. And, yep. uh, you know, one thing we're very proud of with these is we've been doing for many, many years, talk to anyone. Um, everyone has always got a lot of value out of these webinars and seminars. So um, mm. make sure you you jump in and, and book early. Sounds good, mate. Brett, thanks for your time today, as always. We'll see you soon, mate. See you, mate. Thanks. Soon.